Welcome to the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and as always, this is the show where we talk about how things in Montpelier shake out for the rest of us. I'm your host, Olga Peters, as I said, and I have with me this week, Emily Kornheiser, one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Olga. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. And welcome for the first time on the show, Derek W. Black. He is a professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law and author of Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education and the Assault on American Democracy. So glad you can join us today, Derek. Yeah, so exciting to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, we are excited because we have talked quite often about school funding on this show, but we have yet to talk about a series of court cases that have gone through Vermont, but as well in Montana. And I believe there are some pending in Maine and perhaps New Hampshire as well about the school voucher system and school choice uh, laws that these states have. And some folks who are challenging them because they feel um, it doesn't cover enough students, particularly in the case for Vermont, I believe they were religious uh, schools that, that were um, being discussed. Could you give us a little history on this, Derek? And why do these lawsuits matter? Yeah, I mean, th- we have a very long history on, on this question of, of money for private schools because most of our states historically had constitutional clauses that they instituted back in the mid 1800s uh, or, or shortly thereafter that said, if there's public money, it has to be in the public schools. And so they had these provisions that said, cannot provide any money to private schools. Sometimes it may have said sectarian schools as opposed to private. Um, and that word sectarian, we'll, we'll talk about that a lot. That, that set, sets a lot of folks off. Um, and that, that, Inclusion of that phrase sectarian in, in Montana's constitution is what really got the ball rolling in the United States Supreme Court um, a year or so ago. And that provision in Montana simply said no aid to private sectarian schools. It didn't say no aid to private schools, it just said sectarian schools. Mm-hmm. And so the challenge that went up to the United States Supreme Court was this idea that the free exercise of religion was being impeded in Montana because if you weren't religious or you wanted to go to a private uh, non-religious school, secular school, you could go there and receive a, a benefit. It was pretty small. I think it was only $250. But if you wanted to go to a religious school or a sectarian school, you couldn't. And they said that that discrimination against uh, private religious schools violated the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. And the Supreme Court agreed with that. The Supreme Court is very clear. No state is obligated to give out private school vouchers. But if they're going to give them out, they're going to give out some sort of private aid, they can't say, well, everyone is eligible except for religious, uh, religious schools or, or people of faith. And so that was the sort of narrow grounds uh, on which that was uh, struck down. Now there's all sorts of little offshoots about, well, what, what really triggers that rule or doesn't trigger that, trigger that rule. And that's what's been going on in, in Vermont. And, and we've got litigation in Maine and, and we had new litigation here in South Carolina recently. Um, so there, there's a pretty good deal of it to go around right now. And I think one of those cases is likely to end up in the Supreme Court in, in the next couple of years. And so let me just, um, for listeners who might only be aware of sort of the structure of their own town. I think it might be helpful to explain the um, one of the details of Vermont school funding that I don't know if we actually ever have spent that much time on. So in Brattleboro, we have really just sort of your standard public school system. People pay property taxes, it moves around in all the ways we've talked about before, comes back to Brattleboro, and then folks have a public school in their neighborhood that their kids go to. For anything under the age of five, folks are given a certain amount of money to go spend at whatever pre-K school has been designated as an official pre-K by the state. And they have sort of essentially a voucher to go to that school before the age of five with. For a lot of our other towns, they some portion of their public school system, often high school, they don't 
operate their own public school in their region. And so they tell all the students in that region that here's a certain amount of money that you can go spend at whatever private or public school that your family sees fit. That's what happens in Marlboro, Vermont, for instance, mm -hmm. right over the hill. And then we have other districts um, like Manchester or St. Johnsbury that offer what they call academy schools, which are essentially private schools that were in some cases once public schools and became private schools, in some cases have just been private schools that have been in those towns for more than 100 years. And the majority of the town goes there, but that still operates within that same voucher system. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of education in all of these different communities varies a lot because it's often tied to the cost of that particular private school. And so we don't have what um, a lot of other states have charter schools. We don't do that here. And we only do magnet schools up in Burlington because they were actually forced to do that by court order because the schools weren't segregated. I, um, sorry, weren't desegregated. Schools were segregated. But we have this very funny thing that I think a lot of Vermonters don't think of as voucher systems because mm -hmm. they call them academies or um, sort of select school choice but essentially it functions exactly like a voucher system. Yeah, Thank I would you, just, I would just jump in. I mean, because I think that's one thing you know, if you're, you're in a context and I, like you said, you don't sort of realize it all. I mean, I think that for the outsiders looking at, at, at Vermont and, and looking at Maine, you know, the, it, this system is incredibly unique and, and it really is just a function of, you know, the, the sparse population in certain areas as you alluded to. But I, although they're vouchers, we never really sort of thought of them as being vouchers. What we thought of them as being were services the government was contracting for when the government itself couldn't provide the service, right? Oh, interesting. Which is to say, you know, Vermont has to operate a public school system, you know, per its state constitution. And in some places, Vermont over the course of years said, look, we just don't have enough kids to run a high school or, or you know, we don't think it's cost effective. And so we, in this very limited set of circumstances, are going to have a gap fill and help the government do its job. Whereas in other states, right, the voucher, we use that voucher word, we're often talking about anti-public education, right, mm -hmm. which is, this, and I'm not saying it's not anti in Vermont, but, it, but clearly in other states, we think there is something inherently flawed with public schools. If you don't like it, you have a right to go somewhere else. My understanding of Vermont and, Remain, uh, and Maine was not that this is like, you don't like public schools, you can go somewhere else. It is the public schools don't find it cost effective to operate this school in this community and therefore there's other options. And, and that's important because, in my mind because it really means that we should understand those academies, as you call them, as being, they're not public schools, but they're part of the public delivery of public education mm -hmm. and some, mm -hmm. in some sort of, you know, hybrid situation. And so um, I just sort of throw that out there. I think that's um, really important distinction because we, yeah. one, it's the development of them wasn't ideologically driven the way it was mm -hmm. in many other places in the country. Um, it was driven through need, as you said, but that doesn't mean we're not going to get caught up in the ideological battles that are happening all the rest of the country, which I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. But the other distinction that I think is important is that when we talk about essentially it's government contracting for services it doesn't deliver, generally that is an accountable relationship. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is not an accountable relationship. It is not set up as with all of the usual contracting mechanisms that you see in order to ensure that those services that are being delivered are to whatever standards they were contracted for. That is left to the relationship between the parent and the school rather than between the government and uh, school. That's right. And so, you know, whatever arguments we might have in a state like South Carolina or Montana or Tennessee or wherever about what regulation we ought to have of vouchers, that conversation, it seems to me, is ought to be far different in a place like Vermont and Maine, because what we're really doing is discharging a public obligation. And it doesn't seem to me that it is right or fair to be discharging the public education, constitutional public education education 
obligation in Maine without ensuring a lot of safeguards, right? Because those kids in those communities ought to be getting the same sort of guarantees um, that they would in some other place that was operating a public high school. And if the state doesn't have that type of regulation, it's really doing a disservice to a lot of children in those communities. Mm -hmm. You know, just as um, a point of interest, little tinge gently from this conversation, I just want to let listeners know that what Emily brought up about contracts with the state and public non and private um, and state money, it's been a discussion amongst me and some of my journalism colleagues, how interesting it is that with the public um, right to know laws, journalists can see a lot of what happens with state money. But as soon as it enters a nonprofit, quite often that state money disappears into the privacy of the nonprofit. Um, and I know that seems tangential, but it, it to me, it brings up that question of accountability and where is state money going. Um, and that is sort of a, a, um, a wormhole in Vermont's right to know laws that money can, state money can very is easily disappear into private nonprofits pretty easily. And I, that's absolutely true in the case of private schools, even private schools that are working with very vulnerable populations, such as Kernhattan, which is one school that we've been um, having some eyes on lately. Mm -hmm. So Derek, I would love to hear more about sort of all of these different court cases that are swirling around the national landscape and how you imagine they might impact Vermont's conversation. But Olga has a question for before that. I do. Sorry. Thank you, Emily. I just want to jump in. Derek, do you mind backing up a little bit and talking a little bit, if you can, about the separation of church and state? And yeah. if that is playing in here, and I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions of how that actually works in yeah. U.S. law. Sure. So there's really, you know, yeah, well, sometimes members of the Supreme Court have confusion as well. So it means <laughs> that we're all, I wouldn't say we're on the same, same plane, but, but we all have similar problems. And, and it's really because the First Amendment, it's, First Amendment itself um, ha has, a, has tension built into it, right? It says, the state cannot establish religion, right? Okay, so if that's all it said, then we would see clearly that there needs to be this wall or sort of separation between church and state. But it also, right after that, says that it cannot um, um, interfere with the free exercise of religion. So it can't create religion, but it can't interfere with, with uh, Olga's if, if she if, if she's, has a particular faith, can't interfere with that or Emily's or mine or anyone else. And those things often get very close to one another. That sort of got to stay away from religion so as to not establish it. But as I'm staying away from it, am I somehow interfering with free exercise? And that kind of takes us back to Montana again, because you, know, you look at Montana, you look, you look at Vermont, for instance. Um, you know, one of the major reasons why they're saying, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons why they're saying no aid to private religious schools is we want to remain separate from religion, right? We don't want to be accused of establishing religion. So if we start giving money to them and they're teaching, you know, the Bible or, 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 or the Quran or wherever it may be uh, at school and teaching theology, then aren't we helping establish religion? So you had a lot of states that, um, that instituted them for those reasons. Let's, and they've stuck with them for those reasons. Let's keep church and state separate. But what happened in Montana was this idea that, well, that may have been what you were doing, but since this is a general program available for everyone, the Supreme Court said, we think it is discrimination for you to limit um, religious institutions from using it. And that was really um, a brand new concept uh, by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, I'm not trying to pick on individuals, but it, 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 is, it is moved, um, at least if you look at the demographics, I think half, a little bit over half of the court uh, actually went to, to Catholic, uh, you know, private schools and, and oh. hey, you know, look, my, my children go to some Catholic classes. They don't go to Catholic school, but so I'm not, I'm not picking on them, but, they, but there is, there, there is this sort of movement on, on, on the court and, and in society thinking that somehow or another that this limit on establishment of religion is somehow interfering with the free exercise that the people of faith are getting the short end of the stick. And so that's what you saw in uh, in that case. And so 
that's really, I think, the, the center of the challenge for Vermont and, and other places is, well, how can we deal with problems of discrimination based upon, you know, sexual orientation, discrimination based upon race? Um, how can we guarantee certain facts are taught and not impugned? How can we do that um, while not doing something that the Supreme Court claims is discriminating against religious organizations? And that, that so that's, if you sort of thought about the, the, there being this space, and the court has often said there's this play in the joints. That's what they say. There's this play in this joints between free exercise and establishment. And Can you that, say that one more time? They call it play in the joints. That's what Play they, in the joints. Yes, which is joint one is, you know, do not establish religion. Joint two is free exercise clause. And that there's this stuff that kind of exists in between those two joints that doesn't violate either of them, right? That we can't, we can't say that you're always on one side of that. You're either establishing or inhibiting, right? Uh, religion. They say, no, 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 there's this space in between where you're not establishing and you're not inhibiting. The government just kind of gets to decide the play in the joints. Well, if that play in the joints was a hundred yards wide, um, to use a visual you know, metaphor, it was a hundred yards wide prior to the Montana Supreme Court decision, it shrunk to 25 yards wide after that decision. So that, that sort of gray area where you could make good faith determinations of what you thought was good policy shrank dramatically um, after that case. Hmm. Wow. Thank you, Derek. We actually, and I'm so sorry I jumped in on your question, Emily, but I think we should take it to after the break. We have just about five minutes before we need to hear from some of our underwriters, Derek. Are there any other concepts that you think we should leave listeners with before we dive into the court cases themselves in the second half? Well, there's, there's one basic concept that, that that's really the dominant one with this, this gray area right now. And it's what we call the distinction between discriminating based upon religious status and discriminating based upon religious use. I know that I've talked to some reporters there in Vermont, and this, this distinction has wrapped people in, in circles. But, but the shortest version of this is that if we look back the Montana case, the Supreme Court says you cannot tell someone they're ineligible simply because of their religious status. You can't look at a school and go, they're affiliated with a religious institution, their status is religious, and therefore they cannot participate uh, in a voucher program. The court said, there's a separate question about religious use. You can look at this church and go, okay, I understand this is a Catholic school, but I'm not going to say you're ineligible just because you're Catholic. I'm going to want to know, what are you going to do with this money? Mm -hmm. So it may be that I could still say, well, you can't discriminate based upon LGBTQ status, or you can't teach religion as truth, or you must teach A, B, C, D, and E. And if you're going to take this money and spend it on religious stuff, rather than the basic, you know, ABCs, the three R's of public education that we want, then we're not going to give you the money. And that means that what we're doing is limiting the, somebody's ability to use money for religious purposes. And that's different than discriminating against someone just because they, have, they are a member of a religious organization. And that is a key nuance line um, that I think a lot of folks are struggling with right now. And the court cases are, are going to have to sort out a little bit more, but that is the line. Mm -hmm. Emily, any thoughts on um, how what Derek has said pertains to Vermont right now? Um, well, I think this is something that we've actually been wrestling with Vermont in, for wrestling with in Vermont for at least as long as I've been paying attention to this. And we can focus on it in the religious context because I think that's where it becomes the most exaggerated. But what we see with a lot of the schools that accept the tuitioning dollars, whether that's pre-K or high school, is that schools are able to say no to who can attend. Um, whether that's mm -hmm. because a child becomes too complicated um, because of their behavior or their family status or their needs. And that, because there are sort of less eyes on the school, because they're not contractually obligated the way 
full public, the way a public school is to deliver educational quality at whatever level the child needs, um, we wind up with a very divided system here. And so what I think we have right now is we are able, we basically have class and behavior discrimination without um, that we sort of freely accept in our system. And it becomes a turning point for us when we start looking at um, religious and family status discrimination. And so I think there can be some really um, interesting implications as we fight our way through this conversation as a state and I have hopes, this is a very extended sentence with a lot of commas in it. I have a lot of hope that by um, this coming to a head with religious discrimination and family status discrimination, that maybe we'll actually reckon with these issues of racial and class discrimination that I think we've been experiencing in Vermont for a long time through our tuitioning dollars. Uh -huh. Interesting. But Thank I am you. feeling very optimistic here. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I want to note for listeners, and, and Derek, please um, correct me if I get any of this uh, wrong. One thing I found interesting when I was reading some of the back um, coverage of, of these court cases, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it seems to me that there are some national law firms that are actually behind some of these lawsuits rather than say individual single families um, bringing these lawsuits. And one of them I think was called the Liberty Justice Center in Chicago. And there was another one, Alliance Defending Freedom, I believe was another one. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I mean, they, they have been working uh, on this issue for, for several years now, um, you know, the, these cases don't, these cases, a Montana case doesn't end up in the Supreme Court by accident. You know, if, if Vermont uh, ends up in the Supreme Court or South Carolina's case, it won't be by accident that you have individuals who, who, who have a policy goal, right? Their mm -hmm. policy goal is to see more money in private schools, more money in private religious schools, and for the public sector to shrink. And so they are, have been looking for cases and factual scenarios where they can advance that agenda. And anywhere that they can find those facts, then they go and, and, and they litigate and, and they're very sophisticated and very well resourced and we'll get it there. Now, j just so I don't act like I'm throwing glass stones, you know, I worked for a civil rights organization and, and we too wanted to, to see more racial justice in the world. And so, um, we got a lot of calls, I should say, first of all, uh, of people who needed help. We didn't, we didn't have to look too far, but when we were trying to, to, to press certain issues, we, we certainly did the same. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that, that what they're doing is the same as what, what I'm doing, but you know, it, I guess it's in the eyes of the beholder, but yes, they are going around, um, you know, looking for cases to advance this agenda and, and change the law to change mm -hmm. the law or change public policy through the courts. And that's a topic, yeah. that's something that happens across both the ideological spectrum like you described and across sort of the policy spectrum. That's, you know, I think there's a lot of really good sort of pop coverage of how Roe versus Wade happened that way. Um, you know, and the gay cake bakers in Colorado, that was very much one of those cases. So I think um, the, the gay discrimination with the very non-gay cake bakers in Colorado. That was a little bit of too much shorthand, but we see that across many policy areas, right? That's sort of how cases get to the Supreme Court these days. Yeah, that's right. Although maybe the distinction or the distinction that I would make amongst those cases and, and very famous legal scholar made it several decades ago is this idea that the constitution is designed, equal protection in particular, designed to protect the minority from the majority because the majority doesn't actually need a constitution if you think about it. They've got the votes. They can do whatever they want to, right? So they don't need the constitution to protect them, you know, from poor people, like, right? Wealthy people do not need the constitution to protect them from poor people. And throughout history, I think it's relatively fair to say that the dominant religious majority, sort of 
Christian majorities in this country have, have never really needed the Constitution to protect them either. You know, maybe individuals, of, 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 uh, maybe Muslims or, or, or Jewish individuals need that and other faiths, but, but not, you know, Christians. And so, um, so that is actually a, an important distinction. Those, those other cases that we talked about, whether it you know, be LGBTQ or in my case, sort of racial justice, what we're talking about are smaller minorities that have been oppressed and the political system uh, has refused to meet their needs or treat them fairly. And that is the irony, I guess, about this current sort of religious uh, uh, thing is that right, it is the majority Christian faith, to be quite honest, who has blocked the spending of public dollars on private religious schools, because as a matter of principle, they think that isn't good policy. It's not about oppressing themselves. It's about what's good policy. But what we have is a, a subset, primarily, of, of the Christian faith, who disagree with the majority Christian faith and are, the, and, and are therefore really imposing their view, arguably imposing their view, on everyone else. And that is arguably very anti-democratic and isn't mm -hmm. actually eliminating oppression in any in any way. Thank you. We have to go to break, but stay tuned. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us at our Facebook page, our website, the Montpelier Happy Hour .captivate .fm, Apple Podcasts, and Emily's YouTube channel. And Emily, what do we need to remind listeners? The view and views and opinions expressed on the show are those of the host and the guests and not the radio station or any of the platforms where this show airs. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, um, would you mind diving in to the court cases that have been moving through Vermont and, ex and help us understand like what, what they are and what they mean? Yeah, so there was, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, but let's just sort of deal with the ones that, are, that have been decided, uh, the two that's been decided in the federal court. So, you know, one of them dealt with, and, and, and Emily probably understands how it works far better than I in terms of the, the technicalities of it, but there's a program that the state funds um, high school students to take classes in college. I guess they get dual enrollment in their high schools. And if a kid is in one of these, uh, academies, you know, they sort of go to a town tuition uh, program, and those would be all non-religious schools, right, because those are the only ones previously, at least, that had been allowed. So those students were eligible for the sort of dual credit or have the state pay for their, their you know, I guess, community college or whatever, wherever it was that they were going. Well, uh, someone, I don't remember which, not that it matters, but at a private religious school said, I want that too. I, I want to get dual enrollment. And I know those other students at the private school up the street or at the academy, they're getting it. So why shouldn't I get it? And they filed a claim um, much like the, the one in Montana saying, look, this, this is uh, um, discrimination based upon religious status. Private school A, non-religious can get it. Private school B, which is religious, cannot. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said, yes, th this is a violation of the, um, of the Espinoza decision. Can I, I'm, can I interrupt, you, interrupt you for one second? I'm sorry. Yes. Can you explain sort of the scale of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals? Because I feel like normal people don't actually understand that stuff. Yeah, well, let me actually look. I mean, so you have, I was going to say what all states it covered. Actually, I, I'm ignorant enough to not know, but we have um we have 11 circuits um that cover the united states and then we have a dc circuit which would be the 12th so these are the last step before you go to the united states supreme court and thank you so each one is you know covers a pretty large geographic area i'm not sure um i know that vermont is not in the first which is where maine is at so i don't know who's in vermont maybe vermont um New Hampshire. I don't know who, who it must be one of your borders there, but I don't think Massachusetts is not. 
I think it's more helping people just understand it's beyond the state level and right before the Supreme Court is more than enough. Thank you. Right, right before, yeah, right before the okay. Supreme Court. So that that Second Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which is a three three judge panel, um, those that that decision struck down this program in Vermont and said no, you cannot uh, deny this this payment for dual dual enrollment for the private religious school. This is religious status discrimination. Now, the tricky thing there um, is that that litigation was kind of backwards, if you ask me, and it may be because the, the folks that we were talking about earlier plotted it intentionally to be backwards. And the reason why I say it was backwards is that the real defining characteristic of who's eligible for this dual enrollment isn't whether you're religious or non-religious. It is whether you're in a public school, a private academy with the sort of contracting through the public system or purely non, you know, non-public school, non-academy. So that what you really had to look at, it seems to me, is, is the town tuition and program constitutional. If the town tuition and program is constitutional, then the fact that somebody at religious school can't get dual enrollment is kind of irrelevant, right? Because they're not being discriminated against because of their religion. They're just being excluded because they're not in the public or the, the sort of town tuition program. So that's, nonetheless, the court just looks at it and goes, well, private secular school gets it, private religious school doesn't, therefore violates Espinosa. But there was another case going on at the same time, which, which was decided shortly after that town to, that, that dual enrollment case. And that was a challenge to the, to the town tuition program that said, shouldn't, um, well, the challenge was, you are violating my free exercise of religion if you do not allow me to use the town tuition program to go to religious school. You're forcing me to go to a, a secular school. And the second circuit says, well, we already decided the dual enrollment case in favor of religious school, so we have to decide the town tuitioning uh, in favor of the religious school as well. I think those cases should have gone the other, the other order. Um, nonetheless, you have the court striking down the exclusion of religious schools from the town tuition program, the striking down of this dual enrollment uh, program that is excluding um, the, the private religious schools. Now, this brings us back to that conversation we were having before the break. Was Vermont excluding private religious schools just because of their religious status or because it was worried about the fact that they were going to teach religious stuff? Some people would tell you there's some people would say that that's that's a silly distinction. In fact, members of the Supreme Court in, in the Montana case said this whole distinction between status and and use is silly. The reason why a state says no money to private religious schools is not because they hate religious people. It's because they don't want because they know that if they give money to a religious school, they're going to teach theology with it so that basically the status restriction is a proxy for religious use, right? They're not acting with animus, they're trying to restrict the use. Well, nonetheless, um, the Second court, second Circuit Court of Appeals says, we're not gonna get into all of that. All we know is you have words that say no money to religious schools, therefore it is status-based rather than use-based. And Vermont, you know, I don't, I don't know who to point the finger to, I hope I'm not, not pointing it at, at Emily or anyone else, but you know, there was this period in time where Vermont knew that it had, it still knows that it has a problem, um, that it needed to probably transition right after Espinosa towards a use restriction. Instead, they just left the status restriction on. And I also would say, you know, I kind of agree with them. Like if they're worried about use, then the best way to stop religious use is just to not give it to religious schools. But the court has said you can't do that anymore. So the only way that this limitation on, or some limitation on public money in, in Vermont uh, can persist in this town tuition program is if it focuses on not who's receiving the money, but what are they doing with the money? Forget about who's receiving the money and say, what are you gonna do with the money? And I do believe the law is fully on Vermont's side if it says, look, we don't care whether you're a private non-religious school, or you are a private religious school. We need to know what that money is being spent on, and we will not pay for religious instruction. 
So that's one thing Vermont could clearly do. And there may be some, you know, some schools that say, you know what, we don't want that deal, right? Well, and that's my, that's sort of one of my questions. Could we be broader and still sort of stay within the bounds that the court just set for us and say, we are only providing these contract, we are only contracting with these schools that provide all of these very specific protections um, and it would extend beyond religious schools. Yeah, I, in fact, I, that's the exact, you can't, the, the, where you get yourself into trouble is even if you're trying to do a good thing, you come off looking like you're picking on religious schools. That's mm-hmm. gonna set, you know, some members of the court. So, so Emily is exactly right. The way to think about this is forget about who you are and think about what your principles are. What are the principles that Vermont believes are important? Hopefully those principles are no racial discrimination and admission, no disability discrimination and admissions, no sexual orientation, gender or sex discrimination and admissions, no religious ideology discrimination and admission, um, you know, no ELL, you know, English language learner status discrimination and admissions. Uh, we can, I could come up with some more, but we, you know, we probably don't want to list it at list all day long. And to say, we don't care who you are. We care what you're going to do with the money. And you can't do any of those things. I would posit, and I have been emphasizing that we ought to go one step further than just saying, don't discriminate. We ought to also be saying, and we want you to do a set of very specific things. One, two, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. These are the five subjects we want taught. And if you can fill up a school day with those five subjects, I mean you, I mean the state of Vermont, to say we want these subjects, we want this curriculum taught, you won't even have to talk about not teaching religion because hopefully the whole day is going to be taken up with teaching the stuff <laughs> that you know Vermont wants taught. And so people say, well, that's micromanaging. I say, look, you know, I don't know anything about, well, I know a little bit about building the house. Um, but if I was going to build a house, uh, which I will never do again, I, I hope, uh, I would say, you know what? I want a kitchen over there. I want a bedroom over there. I want my stove over there. I want this, you know, go down the list. And, and once I do that, you know, the contractor builds the house, puts the nails in, does all that. If he wants to turn the music up loud, then he can, and whatever he wants. None of my business. But hopefully if I've I've laid out those specifications. I won't find a sauna sitting in front of my couch, right? It's not in the budget. There's no time for that, right? And I won't find a swimming pool in my backyard either, right? And so that's another way of thinking about this. Because you know what? The taxpayers are paying for this, number one. Number two, they're not doing it out of the goodwill of their heart. Let's be clear. Vermont's constitution obligates that they serve these children. And in the same way that Vermont obligates that kids learn certain things in the public schools, they ought to be obligating that if these private schools that want to take public money to discharge the public obligation, that they also teach the things that Vermont wants taught. And there's nothing micromanagey about that. There's nothing wrong, nothing more wrong than me saying I don't want a sauna in front of my couch in my living room. And that's what that's what Vermont needs to do. And importantly, something that we um didn't have previously because we do leave so much of curriculum decisions to district level decision makers um, is act one from last biennium, which is very specific around social equity standards in the schools. And so social equity measurements in the schools and social equity curriculum taught in the schools. And so, and that's really one of the first places we've ever even begun to interfere in some of those conversations at the school level because we leave so much to the district to decide. Yeah, I mean, we had, I mean, look, you know, you might've thought that I I want to micromanage our teachers. No, I don't, right? I think think when when we talk about parameters, they can be very precise or they can be broad, right? You can say, um, I don't want to use too many house analogies. I want a three bedroom house or I want a four bedroom house. But if you say I want a three bedroom house with these size rooms, there's no room left for a fourth one. And that doesn't get down to dictating everything in that room. And I think that's the thing, right? It's not that we have to, to not leave any discretion to these private schools. I mean, I think that's, that's 
kind of the, the, the wrong idea. Mm-hmm. But, we, but we need to know what we're buying. I mean, that that's really what it comes. You need to know what you're buying. No one, you know, signs a contract to build a house without knowing what that house is going to be, right? No one buys a car at the Ford dealership without knowing, you know, whether it has GPS or air conditioning or, you know, ventilated seats. Like we need to know these things. We're not micromanaging Ford when we say, you know, I want GPS and ventilated seats or whatever your favorite thing. Just, that's what I'm buying. If you don't have it, I'll go buy it from, you know, Toyota or Chevy or whoever. And I think this is just good public stewardship of, of the money. If it is the case, to go back to my first premise, if it is the case that Vermont is not in the business of buying religious education, then Vermont needs to be specific about what is the education that it is buying. Because if all you're saying is we are buying education and you don't define what that education is, then religion does fit within the definition of education. But if you define the education to be an education that does A, B, and C or includes A, B, and C, then it may be through implication excluding religion because that's not what we're buying. And one of the interesting things, I think, sort of if we do set that and name that and make that explicit, right now, the Agency of Education has been quite clear over the last just few weeks that even the things that we do specifically require right now, which is a fairly limited list to... um, license or certify an independent school, there is no actual verification of whether or not that's being provided. Um, So a school needs to make sure that they are going through a checklist, but sort of the flip side of that, which is, you know, going into the school to verify that those things are happening the way we would with any other nonprofit contractor. I have worked at a lot of nonprofits and there is always someone showing up for an audit of not just your finances, but your program. And we are not doing that. Our agency of education right now is not doing that with our independent schools. Yeah, that, that's right. You can't pick on religious schools. You've got to look at all of them. And I will use the housing one more time. I was thinking about it earlier. You know, the government, federal government pays for uh, housing for, for millions of low-income people across this country. And you know what? They will not pay the rent on a house without checking, is there lead in the paint? Are the shingles up to date? On, it seems, if you wanna to go tomorrow, folks wanna to buy a house, you wanna buy an FHA loan insured home, same thing, right? Because the federal government saying like, you know, we don't have any problem with individuals making free choices about where they wanna live at, or what house they wanna buy. But if the government is gonna stand behind it or subsidize it, there are some checks and we're gonna go out there and check them and if you don't meet that, then, then you don't aren't getting the money. Mm-hmm. So Emily and, and Derek, I don't know which one of you can answer this. Um, I would love if possible, if we could put these court cases in context with Vermont's educational landscape in general. And I'm wondering, does this connect back at all to or, or is it impacted by the 1999 Brigham decision? Or um, what about the current pupil waiting study? Like is any, any of this kind of bouncing off each, each other? <laughs> Do you have a ghost in your office? I'm sorry, I, we have these very large ridiculous rubber band balls that like my, I don't know, someone gave to my, a grandparent gave to my son and they're on the shelf and they all just somehow fell off the shelf and are now bouncing around the office. And I don't know how it, it is a little ghosty. <laughs> They've stayed there for the last year of Zoom calls, but now they're falling down. Um, for, you know, it's the thing about people waiting is it's really, um, and the Brigham decision and sort of that, not about Brigham, but the actions that the state took post Brigham which were not about equity of opportunity, which is what Brigham was about, but about equity of funding, which is interesting that our sort of our state response to a mandate around equity of opportunity was around equity of funding. Um, Those, that entire world that is now people waiting that we are taking on this summer really doesn't reference our independent school and tuitioning system. And even as we were drafting the mandate for this summer task force, 
it was hard to ensure that those conversations were going to take place as part of it, even though they very much impact the individual budgets of communities and how the cost of education changes in Vermont. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, that's a fantastic question because it's, it's actually a point that I always start with in my legislative testimony, which is a lot of legislators, and I don't, I don't I'm not going to put Emily in this because she obviously has a better sense of it, but um, they act as though, or typically act as though, vouchers, charters, and public school funding are three separate conversations. Um, and in an alternative universe, that would be true. But the universe we live in the United States of America is, by my estimation, probably about 40 or so states are violating their state constitutional obligation to provide adequate and equal education under their state constitution. And it is my position, uh, based upon constitutional analysis and arguments that we sometimes make in the courts, that the public education constitutional obligation is what I call a primary obligation. In some states, they say it is the former foremost obligation. It is the first obligation. In Nevada, for instance, which had voucher litigation a few years ago, the very first appropriation bill each year has to be for public schools. Same thing in Pennsylvania, for instance. They have a, a system, a very complicated system of, of legislating in, in, in Pennsylvania. But the, in the first package, in the first session, like the only thing you can do is public education. And this is not just formality. This is, this is the representation of the fact that not only do you have to provide public education, it's an absolute duty. It is the first thing you must do. Okay, I won't keep going on and on, but that framing is incredibly important because I do not understand the theory under which you could go out and create something outside of your public education system, spend money on an alternative to your public education system before you had first discharged your public education duty. It would be, to me, the, the same thing as serving uh, dessert before, for, you know, for those carnivores out there serving ice cream before your steaks are even off the grill, right? You can't do Sounds that. Sounds great. Right? Um, <laughs> and so, did you say that's what you do, Emily? I said that sounds great. It is not oh. what I do, but it does sound great. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so, um, and, and, and that, and, and so that is sort of a priority and step order. But there's also this, this more fundamental problem. It's not a technical problem. And I'll point to Ohio's voucher program, which is one of the early ones that went to the Supreme Court in a case called Selman. At the, so, Ze, so Ohio forms this voucher program. It goes up on all these separation of church and state issues. And I said, look, you're missing the big issue here. Because when was it? What was the moment in time that Ohio decided that it needed a voucher program? At the very moment when its state Supreme Court had declared its public education financing system to be unconstitutional. At the very moment the federal courts had brought Cleveland City Schools into receivership for their failure to desegregate. And it's at that very moment that the state of Ohio says, we'll create a voucher system for the children of, of Cleveland. This makes no sense because what you really are doing is saying, you're not giving children options amongst relatively equal options, what you're really saying is we have failed to do our constitutional job, provide public education. We have failed to do our constitutional job, provide integrated education. And rather than doing that, we hope you'll all just leave and go somewhere else. We have created a formal opportunity for white flight for you. Yes, there you go. And, and so, you know, but I always, you know, it, it, I always sort of, and it's never been it's really litigated as this sort of priority order, uh, because it gets very complicated. When we go after vouchers or charters, people litigate, they just say, is it all by itself in a little vacuum? Does it violate the state constitution? Or in a little vacuum, does it violate religious clause? And the argument I'm making is far more complicated, which is we can't answer the question of whether this voucher program is constitutional without also knowing whether you are meeting your state constitutional duty in public, uh, public schools. And that is the Brigham decision. That is a 10 year mm -hmm. litigation or 20 or 30 year litigation. And it's very hard to bring this little thing, right? Vouchers in this much larger conversation, but I believe we have to understand them as 
particularly in a place like Vermont, where the the, the town tuitioning is actually part of the public education system. I think that argument is actually far easier to make in Vermont and Maine because they are tied together. Whereas, you know, in South Carolina and other places, it, it sits off to the side a little bit more, at least at least facially. I very much hope you can come in and testify for the people waiting task force as we move into sort of that appropriate time this summer. Sure, I'll do Thank that. you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Emily, for you as a, as a lawmaker, what has um, some of Derek's comments brought up and, and is anything here making you um, rethink or has it added to any of your thoughts on education and education policy? Well, um, as I said, uh, sort of regarding my hopes for all of this at the beginning mm -hmm. of the hour, I, I hope that this is sort of the this can be the last straw for us in really pursuing real accountability across our education system. I, I see how deeply entrenched our tuitioning system is in Vermont communities. And I am one human and one legislator, and I will not hope to even imagine what it would take to do away with that right now. Um, but given how much it brings up our rural urban political divides, and why so many Vermont, so many Vermont, new Vermonters have moved to the communities they've moved to. It's, um, it's sort of the untouchable piece of Vermont education right now. But I think bringing some real accountability to those systems would go a very, very long way in um, shrinking some of the negative impacts that we're seeing on them. And there was a moment as we were drafting the people waiting task force legislation this session where I started to think that I was off in my um, deep drive to ensure that we were discussing the tuitioning system as we discussed people waiting and Brigham this summer. And everyone else seemed to think that I was like just sort of adding extra I was adding too many factors into the mix and that was sort of outside of the purview of the task force. And I now have a um, renewed faith in my, in my own theory and um, <laughs> want to make sure that we take that on this summer. Cause it is, it's a, it's really essential to how both we understand Brigham and meet Brigham in Vermont and to um, how education finance is structured. So that's it for me. The third part that we haven't talked about today um, that I think is really, really important is as we continue to invest enormous amounts of state dollars in our early care and education system, which is, you know, birth to five. And we're doing some really, really good work on that right now. And we're looking to do even more good work on that. I think we need to make sure that what we sort of um, affectionately coin the mixed delivery system, um, which is a mix of public and private, I think we need to be really, really careful about the implications for what happens there on the rest of Vermont's public education system. And I don't think we've spent enough time talking about that at all. Okay, interesting. Now, I, can, I just jump, I mean, Emily's raising a very important point. It comes up in South Carolina quick. This is gonna be a 30 second answer. So, which is, well, we're already spending money on these private pre-K programs that are religious or this, that, or another. So why is it that you think, this, this is the governor speaking to me last summer or governor's attorneys when we were litigating a case. Why is it that you aren't complaining about the pre-K thing? You're only complaining about the K through 12. And so, you know, without getting into a discussion right now as to whether those things are separate, um, what we do know is that when the state starts funding private pre-K with no regulation, it then sort of calls out the, the, the wolves to go after, you know, private unregulated K through 12. And, you know, that, that's just sort of the practicalities of what we've seen nationally happen. Thank you. So we are just about out of time, Derek, but I want to touch base and, and see if there's anything else you want to leave listeners with, or what do you feel is Vermont's best way forward, given where we are at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't purport to get it. it into the weeds of what Vermont ought to do. I think Emily's got, got a very good, I'm confident in, in her ability to, to lead the charge Thank on you. This, from what she's been saying. So, but I will say, I would just add, I mean, I think 
it's very easy and typical to get bogged down in the nuances of a wonky policy stop. And I, I know Emily and I could, could talk all day about this, but I think, you know, I think this conversation has to be always first and foremost about values um, because, mm-hmm. you know, one of the problems that a lot of legislators have is when they show up in the state house, they, they think the world has created a new on the day they got there, that, that no constitutional <laughs> system existed before they got there. And, and if one's going to exist afterwards, it's going to be the one that they make. And you know we've got we've got some deep seated values that have persisted across time that, that have made good parts of America and bad parts to, to be clear. But but I think a lot of this public school conversation of where we got to is about good values, and what we have now are a set of other values masquerading as equity, sort of masquerading as fairness, you know, masquerading as good financial policy. Um, and I say, you know, as soon as we start going down this road of particularly like, well, do vouchers save money or don't save money? Do kids perform well in voucher schools or not voucher schools? You know, do they perform well in terms that we're actually asking the wrong question? And that's one of the key theses in, in my book, um, Schoolhouse Burning, uh, is that these are value questions. What kind of democracy do we want to build? And to be quite honest, I could care less whether a charter or a voucher school uh, improves the standardized test score of a kid in, in math or English by a point or two, if what that kid leaves that school with is, is a set of values that don't represent the best of America. And, and so again, I just think we have to think about how do we to build, build democracy? And you don't have to look any further than, than January the 6th to understand how, how important those values are. And so, you know, it, it, you know, it's long-winded and sometimes it's boring and people don't pay attention, but I just think we, we got to think about first principles and values and community and equity and inclusion. I know I heard a lot of that from Emily, which is, which is one of the reasons I have, have faith in her trying to figure out the details of, of, of those values and policy, but I think that's where we have to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Emily, would you make a toast to carry us out of the show? I will. Thank you. Um, The true equity of opportunity, which is not equality of opportunity, it's equity of opportunity, meaning that we need to do a lot of work still to strengthen each aspect of our public education system so that all kids can meaningfully contribute to their communities into the future. Cheers. Cheers, thank you. Derek, if people would like to find more of your work or, or find your book, where is a good place for them to do that? Well, hopefully there's an independent bookstore there that they can pick it up at. But, um, but Schoolhouse Burning, um, Public Education and the Assault on American Democracies, available pretty much anywhere online. You want, you want to catch it. And I'm on Twitter more often than I should be, but I have taken vacation recently. But uh, at Derek W. Black, um, all, you know, commenting on on stuff there in Vermont at times, but these issues across the nation. So happy to connect there. And um, you, know, you can find me um, on my law school website or my personal website too, if, if you wanna see more about my research and other books that I've written. Thank you. Emily, where can folks find you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you'll get a link to all of my social media posts, my blog posts, sign up for my newsletter. And please email address, and then please stay tuned. We're going to do a series of policy forums in real life throughout the summer. Thank you. And as always, the Montpelier Happy Hour airs on Friday afternoon on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. And you can also find us at our Facebook page, our webpage, and Apple Podcasts. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.